once colossal empire is drowning in the seas of colossal failure. As the UK falls apart over the economy, politics, housing and inflation, its ruling influence has transformed into irrelevance. Can the UK withstand the pressures it faces, or will it fade into oblivion? This is living history. The British Empire lasted for over 400 years, but in just over a decade, Britain has become a shadow of itself. The current Conservative government has been in power for 30 years. Under their leadership, the UK has rotated through a revolving door of Prime Ministers, five in total. In 2010, David Cameron returned the Conservatives to government. Decisions made under his premiership arguably marked the beginning of the end of the UK. Cameron had to tackle the fallout of the 2008 global financial crisis, which left the UK economy facing its most significant financial instability in 70 years. The government was in a mass deficit and the public was facing a recession. As he grappled with economic decline, unity between Scotland and England was also challenged in 2014 by an independence vote, which returned 55% no to 45% yes. Scotland, however, remains restless, and support for independence has been growing since the great fallout of 2016, that is, of course, the Brexit vote. The UK voted to leave the EU by 52% to 48%. Leave won the majority of votes in England and Wales, while every council in Scotland voted a Remain majority. Cameron apparently underestimated the undercurrent of unrest that had been brewing in the UK. People needed something to blame, and Europe became the scapegoat. By calling attention to these controversial divisions through votes and referendums, he inadvertently sparked the beginning of an ununited, geopolitically isolated kingdom. Still, he did champion and introduce same-sex marriage in England and Wales in what he calls one of his proudest moments. But after the Brexit vote, Cameron realized what a disaster the result was and ran away. I mean, stepped down. Theresa May stepped in, but would become so exhausted with Brexit negotiations, she too would resign after three years, despite surviving two votes of no confidence called by her own party. As the process of withdrawing the UK from the EU unfolded, it became clear that there were divisions within the leading government itself. There were hardline Brexiteers who wanted to burn the EU to the ground and build a wall around the UK, and on the other end of the spectrum, those who actually started to realise leaving was a terrible idea. Politics itself was in turmoil, and May understandably jumped ship. Of course, while all this Brexit chaos was going on, broader social and political issues took a back seat or were abandoned entirely, and the people watched in confusion and mild horror. Enter Boris Johnson, who promised to sort out Brexit once and for all, but instead mumbled and guffawed his way through debates in the House of Commons for the first year or so and called for a general election in 2019. Unexpectedly, the Conservatives won its largest majority since 1987. Now that was out of the way, Johnson went on about passing an agreement for withdrawing from the EU, and the UK formally left on January 31st, 2020. Now things could really begin. For a few months, until the UK went into a Covid lockdown in March 2020. Johnson's government has since been heavily criticised for its handling of the pandemic, in a scandal known as Partygate. Government parties and gatherings that were in breach of public health restrictions took place in 2020 and 2021, which Johnson first denied knowing anything about, then denied that they were in breach of anything. His health secretary Matt Hancock has been publicly slaughtered for mismanaging the government's COVID response so catastrophically that thousands of vulnerable people in care homes died. But he still managed to have an affair to presumably ease the stress. Johnson was fined for breaking lockdown rules in April 2022. But since the UK can barely make it a few months without a scandal, in July, Johnson admitted to appointing Chris Pincher as Deputy Chief Whip despite being aware of sexual assault allegations against him. Amid public exhaustion and protest, Johnson eventually resigned on July 7th. Then, for about five minutes, Liz Truss, who no one had actually ever heard of at this point, suddenly became the UK's new Prime Minister. During her time, Truss introduced policies in response to the cost of living crisis, including tax cuts, price caps on energy bills, and government help to pay them. Sold as Trussonomics, the markets weren't having any of it, and instead what followed was Crashonomics. After the mini-budget announcement, the pound fell to a record low. 
control, leaving the economy in further shambles. 44 days later, Truss resigned. The current PM Rishi Sunak stepped in and promised to sort the whole thing out. Most of the public at this point had lost track of who exactly is the Prime Minister, but also largely stopped caring. Amid the cost of living crisis and other social issues they realized they may have to sort out amongst themselves. The economy is completely destabilized. Despite promising to bring everything down, inflation has reached its highest level in over 40 years, climbing above 11% in October 2022. Unemployment rates are rising. Post-pandemic economy recovery has been dire. It is still lower than pre-pandemic levels. Earlier this month, the UK's second largest city, Birmingham, effectively declared itself bankrupt. Schools, hospitals, and public buildings are literally crumbling. Scotland's restlessness is rearing its head once again. In November 2022, then First Minister Nicola Sturgeon proposed a second independence referendum for Scotland. However, the UK Supreme Court ruled the Scottish Parliament cannot hold a second independence referendum without Westminster approval, fueling anger amongst pro-independent Scots. Immediately after the ruling, Sturgeon said, Scottish democracy will not be denied. Sunak is struggling to hold his government, and the country together, and the rest of the world knows it. At the recent G20 summit, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi changed a prize trip to his house originally scheduled for Sunak, instead reserving the meeting for US President Joe Biden. The two eventually did meet, in a conference room and without much fanfare. And Modi wasn't the only one to cancel on Sunak as a delegation of business executives called off a planned function after struggling to navigate roadblocks. Was Modi's citywide shutdown a symbolic display of power, or a carefully calculated decision to further isolate and humiliate Sunak? There is no doubt that the changes to Sunak's schedule reflect a change in international politics and the UK's global standing. Its future is uncertain, but what is certain is the UK is now seen as a country that hates every other country. Asylum seekers, the NHS, the climate, a decent living wage, making sure its own people are warm and fed, and at one bizarre point, pork markets and imported cheese. It has become the international example for how not to run or be a country. Society has ruptured between hard nationalism and what the hell is going on, maybe I can get an Irish passport and get out of here rationalism. It has come to define itself by terrible catchphrases like get Brexit done, it still isn't done, and stop the boat. It projects an image of nostalgia for the good old days of empirical autonomy while simultaneously completely missing the irony that the UK was built on trade and partnerships with other the countries, which the rest of the world is increasingly disinterested in doing. This is Living History, signing out. And if you enjoyed this video, please do support our channel by commenting and subscribing to help the algorithm.